pretty cool. It is cool. Well, now the sun's coming out. Probably okay. Get a rain. Here we are at the Hobson Plantation Farm in Clarksdale, Mississippi. We have uh, Jim James Butler. James Butler, um, um, w one of the people who inherited the farm, or one of the current people on the farm. Mr. Butler, you know, why you manage the family or your wife's family managed to revolutionize uh, cotton farming in the world in 1944. Can you explain more about that? Yeah. Um, they, well, they founded Hobson in 1852, built this headquarters in 1924, and for about 17 years they worked, well, they, to be by the railroad, that's why they positioned themselves here. That road, which is blacktop now, was gravel. That was Highway 49 at the time. So they put the headquarters here to be by the railroad and to be by 49 for transportation. Um, this was the headquarters for Hobson, and for 17 years they worked with International developing the cotton picker. Harvest International? International Harvest. Uh, International Harvest, that's a cotton picker. Right. And before 1944, how did this revolutionize the way you pick cotton? Well, it, um, you know, it was hand picking. And they had about 4,000 acres, 3,800 cultivated acres um, of cotton. And so they had about 100 families that lived on the place, that lived in sharecropper shacks. It's a sharecropper system. Yeah. And they would hand pick. So trying to hand pick, you know, 3,800 acres of cotton was difficult and the Industrial Revolution was coming along and the war was going on and, you know, you had people leaving the Delta just as fast as they could to, for better lives, yeah. you know, full-time jobs in Detroit and yeah. Chicago. And so, I mean, they, they were just simply were not the, pick, the hands here anymore. Uh, Hobson didn't like the sharecroppers. Yeah, let's anyway. go go closer. Yeah, they didn't like that. Yeah, no, did not see that as a good system for him or for the people, the sharecroppers. Yeah, so, this was something that he hoped that they could get, and knew they would uh, at some point. And if if you can see, this is just a, a tractor. Yeah, and this was an implement. That's an implement. Yeah, it, it it would go on to the same tractor that pulled the disc and pulled the plows and pulled the planters and all that. So. You know, that same tractor would, would do all that. And then they would just put that cotton picker on barrels over in the shop yard until they needed it. So it was it was not a standalone unit like you see today. Okay. The cotton pickers today, they are, they are self-contained units. Um, okay. This was an implement. But so they, uh, they worked on that for 17 years, developing that. And that could pick, when they brought it out in 44, it could pick as much as 50 men in a day. Wow. So they had 12 of them here on Hobson in 44. Okay. So, you know, that's pretty good. Uh, uh, so he was an engineer, the original Hobson or something. This is like a most, this is a transformational investment done by, because you don't, you didn't have the labor, the labor costs and nobody wants to pick pot, you know, nobody, of right. course, it's the hardest job in the world. That's why they were slaves because n there's no way you could get a labor force to do it. And it's also seasonal. So right. these, these guys, they didn't have full-time jobs. You know, they, they chopped a little cotton during the season and and they picked cotton at the end of the year, but other than that, you know, when the, these, uh, the sharecroppers didn't have full-time jobs, and you know, it was- it So what did they do when they weren't picking cotton? Well, you know, they had uh, little rows of sharecropper shacks on the river bank or around, you know, just around all the plantations, and you know, they would have gardens, and somebody would have a pig, and, or pigs, and some would have a, some milk cows. And, okay. You know, they just, they, they were survivors. You know, they, they and this is also the birth. That's why this is the birthplace of the blues because such a miserable existence. That's where the blues is, and of course, the blues was what rock and roll is and the biggest American export. So, right now, what is the percentage of cotton production now in Mississippi? It's like I think 15%. I mean, the U.S. is like 15% of the global market. I don't know exactly now. Um, the last couple of years, it dropped way back. Way back. Really fell off a lot. Um, but the la that was for several years. Corn started coming in, uh, you know, when they yeah. all and all that. Well, that that's kind of gone away. But in cotton has made a, a big comeback. But I really don't know what the percentage is. Okay. Now. But these last couple of years, cotton is making a comeback. I was really worried about it from a tourism standpoint. Yeah. Know, having a how about on a price standpoint? We're we're interested yeah. in the commodity futures market. It's, I mean, you know, it's it's still kind of low. Um, but you know, I don't think I, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to bounce back. You know, I don't know. You know what I'm right. I don't know. I mean, here we have the Shack Up Inn, which is a place where people like Robert Plant, CEOs from around the world, come to visit and hear the blues. So, 
it was the most exclusive but well well kept secret and but thank you so much sir yeah appreciate it come back and come back and see us 